Hello and welcome to part 2 of our advanced PIM sparse mode lecture in the IP multicast lecture series. In part 1 of this lecture we covered in detail the join mechanisms that are used by the RP and the last hop routers to initiate star comma G and S comma G trees towards the sources or towards the RPs and the actual messages and the details of the messages that are used to initiate those trees. This lecture will cover the PIM registration process from the first top routers to the RP in a lot of detail. Once again, the prerequisite to this particular lecture is lecture 7, which covers basic PIM sparse mode and gives you an idea of what an RP is, what a first top router is, what the registration process is needed for. Those basics will not be rehashed here, but really, if you look at that lecture, this lecture makes a lot more sense. So having said that, let's begin our lecture. The PIM register messages primary job, the main job that it entails is to inform the RP of a multicast network about an active S comma G state. So you have a source that is sending a multicast stream. So that's your S comma G state. PIM register message is going to carry the information about that state from a first hop router which is automatically aware through source signaling about the state to the RP so the rest of the network can now be aware of this S comma G state. And really this is, this S comma G is the most important piece of information. So if I had a message that literally just carried the S comma G state, and somehow got that message from the first top router, the FHR connected to the source, to the RP, that would be sufficient for registration purposes. But there is more optimization that is built into the registration process. And we will talk about this, but to talk about that, we first have, it has a lot to do with the structure of the actual message. So to discuss the structure, Think back on how the FHR, so an actual FHR, how does it learn about the active sources? So what was the process of the source signaling? Well, it was via the data plane. So literally, the FHR will receive a multicast packet. That multicast packet will have a source, and it would have a destination, which would be a multicast address. So that's the S comma G. And once the FHR receives this message or receives this packet from its directly connected host, so in this case the sender, it now knows about this S comma G state. Well, think about if the RP received the same multicast packet somehow. We're not discussing as to how it receives it, but instead of the FHR, it was the RP who received that same multicast packet. Now the RP could process it identically, identically to how the first hop router is processing it. And it would also have this S comma G information. And this is exactly what the register message does, the PIM register message does. It transports, so it literally takes that multicast packet and it transports it from the FHR to the RP. And once the RP has it, now the RP has the S comma G state and it can bootstrap all of the other processes that it needs to. Well, how does the register message actually does it? It's actually extremely simple. And what we are using is what I call the ultimate duct tape of IP networks. It is going to use a unicast tunnel to tunnel that multicast packet. So the multicast packet is tunneled inside that unicast packet and that unicast packet, it's just unicasted from the, uh, from the first hop router to the rendezvous point, the RP, and it can be routed simply using the unicast routing information base. So let's take a look at the actual structure of the message and then we'll look at the mechanisms of it and it'll make a little bit more sense. But for right now, think of a multicast packet that is being tunneled just like GRE or just like an IP and IP tunnel 
inside a unicast packet and it travels from the FHR directly to the RP. Here's the actual packet format. So all of these packets, all of the register, uh, PIM register packets, they're going to share a common header. And that common header, I think we have encountered it before. There's a version number that is important in it. And the version number almost always is going to be version two. The type of this message is type one. So register messages have a type of one that identifies that the packet actually carries a register message. The next thing of value here is something called a border bit. But as long as the source is directly connected to the FHR, you're not using any other mechanism. So it's very simple. The source is directly connected at layer two to the FHR. It would usually be just set to zero. So and an actual by definition FHR first hop router will set this to zero. And that's the end of that. There is also something called the end bit or the null register bit. And this null register bit will come in useful for the steady state, and we'll discuss it at that time. In fact, I discuss it even in this, but it's really only there for steady state. Now, this particular structure, so this structure is what is in red up here. So right there. This is followed by the actual multicast packet. So the multicast data packet is the rest of the packet. So once you, uh, once you identify the type of the packet, which is the register message, the recipient is now expecting the actual multicast data packet, which is now contained here. And if you look at it, that is literally just an actual IP packet. So in this IP packet, there's a version type of service, total length, time to live, the protocol itself, all of those things are right in here. And this is really just the original packet that was received by the FHR. And that packet in its entirety is being tunneled inside this PIM registration message. So this is the data that is being tunneled. And the most important information. So we discussed the most important information was going to be this S comma G. Well, this is contained in the source IP and the destination IP fields. So in one fell swoop, you not only got the data that was received by the FHR from the FHR to the RP, you also got the most important information, which was the S comma G. So once the RP processes this packet, it has information about the S comma G, but the optimization part comes in, it now also has that multicast data. So it has the actual multicast data that was received by the FHR, and without use of multicast, it went from the FHR to the RP. Now think of if the RP has any actual receivers. So any receivers that are on its RPT or the star comma G tree, it can simply take this data out of this packet, out of the registration packet, and it can now multicast it down the star comma G tree. But hold on to that thought and we'll discuss it in a lot more detail. Now for the steady state, so for the steady state, that means the RP is already aware of that S comma G, RP and the FHR have already talked before, they have already exchanged some registration messages before. In that particular case, the FHR and the RP realize that there is some multicasting actually happening uh, and there is no need for this tunneling anymore. So, you know, there is some bandwidth utilization and some actual processing that is needed for that tunneling. And they realize for a steady state when everything is up and working and has been for a while, they don't really need to send all of this information all the time. So instead of a full multicast data packet for a steady state, the FHR is going to use what is called a null register. And in the null register, there is simply just a dummy IP header. There is no multicast data in that IP header. It's just a dummy IP header. And a couple of things that are important about that header. There is an S and there is a destination, which is the G. So th there is information about the S comma G that you're trying to keep alive. PIM is soft state. So you really need to keep all of these states alive. So if the FHR is still 
receiving data from that particular source, the S, and it is receiving that particular stream G, then it basically just every number of seconds needs to inform the RP that, hey, this is still good, the source is still alive, and that is the, that is the reason for this null register. The IP protocol in the, the dummy multicast header is going to be 103, which is PIM, and the TTL is going to be zero because really there is no packet in any real sense. So all you're trying to do is get this S comma G state over from the FHR to the RP just to keep it alive, just to reset all of the timers on the RP. We're going to discuss this in a little bit more detail too, but there's not a lot going on here. It's basically just a dummy IP header and uh, it keeps the state alive. So now it's time to take a look at the actual mechanics of how this would happen. And this is the FHR informing the RP of the active sources. So there is a source here and we've seen this particular, if you've seen, if you've kept up with the lectures, you've seen this particular drawing many times now. But in this particular one, there is an S and it is sending a G to our FHR. So the FHR has this S comma G state. So for all intents and purposes, suppose this is the very first packet that was received by R1 from this particular S. And what is going to happen? is that the R1 or the FHR is going to send that unicast register message over to the RP. And if you realize the MHRs, so in this case, the MHR, which happens to be R2, so the MHR, which happens to be R2, it really routes that message or forwards that particular packet as it would any unicast packet. So what do you do with a unicast packet? You look at the destination. Most of the time you don't even look at the source, you just look at the destination and you forward it on towards R3. So this particular packet, the register message, will have the destination of R3. It is a unicast packet. And this message is really not processed by the MHRs other than to just forward it. So the source IP here is going to be the, well, you usually pick something, so it could be a loopback, or it could be, if there is nothing, then it could simply be just the exit interface that is on here, or it could be, like I said, the loopback, and the And the actual destination is going to be the, R, the RP's IP address. So that's a well-known IP address that we have been familiar with. And uh, it could be a loopback on R3. It could be an actual physical interface. Most of the times, it's going to be a loopback on R3. And R3 is simply going to get that message. And once it gets that message, now it can create this S comma G state on itself and uh, it can start the whole PIM process, which we will discuss in detail. So there is a little bit more than this that is happening because remember that multicast packet is still tunneled inside this unicast message and how the RP reacts to it will really depend on the states that are present on the RP, but for right now, just a unicast message, it kind of tunnels through R2. So there is really not much more going on here. Now the counterpart to the PIM register message is the PIM register stop message. Now this is a unicast message that is sent in the reverse direction. So it is sent from the RP to the FHR. So it's, it's literally the reverse of the register message. It is very similar to the register message, but one thing to note is it is not a tunnel or an encapsulation type of message. So that concept doesn't apply here because realize this, the FHR had a need for that tunneling mechanism. It wanted to get some multicast data from itself to the RP. The RP has no such need. So there's no tunnel or encapsulation going on here. 
What is going on here is simply the S comma G information. So the S comma G information, it's not in a dummy IP packet or nothing, nothing like that. It's simply just present in the actual message. So if you look at the actual message here, once again, there is a version on here, which is version two. We've talked about that. So the version is version two. The type is two, which is a register stop message. So just like type one was register message, type two is register stop message. And then after that, there is no dummy IP header. There is simply an indicator of the group and indicator of the source. So this is your S comma G and it is contained in these two fields here. So that information just simply goes from the RP back to the FHR. Now, what the RP is trying to achieve by using the register stop message is it's telling the FHR to stop sending any more register messages. Because remember, it's a multicast network and register messages are unicast. So really, even though there is some optimization there, you want to receive all of that information via multicast and not unicast. And what the RP does is once it ascertains that it has enough information to receive these packets via multicast, it needs to tell the first half messages, uh, first half routers to stop the registration process. And that is the sole purpose of the register stop. So what will happen in a steady state network is the registration, especially the null register that we discussed on the last slide, the null register and the register stop messages, the whole process keeps on repeating periodically. So once the steady state is established and once the multicast tree is up and functional, what would happen every 60 seconds or 90 seconds or 180 or whatever that number is, the FHR will send a null register message with a dummy IP header and immediately the RP should respond with a register stop message and that would put the FHR basically in a hold down pattern for whatever amount of time that they have agreed to. So whatever that hold down time is, the FHR just enters that hold down time. Now, there are a lot of different decisions. How the RP actually responds to the reception of a register message, that really depends on its state. And it depends on the state that it has for that particular group. So really, there could be a lot of different decision points here. I've tried to cover a whole bunch of them, but in all honesty, I could have missed a corner case here. So the very first thing, the RP receives a register message, and it really, this is the first time it is ever hearing about that group. It has no star comma G state for that group. So no interested receivers, no LHRs have actually, uh, have actually joined an RPT to the RP for that particular group. In this case, really the register message is coming for a group nobody is interested in. So what would the RP do? The RP doesn't really have any use for this particular uh, multicast stream. So in order to stop the FHR, from sending more and more multicast messages and sending them over a uh, over you know a unicast infrastructure the rp should immediately respond with a register stop message so yes i am aware of your active source so you have an s comma g i'm aware of it and uh, i really have no need for it yet so stop sending me those messages now the dr or the LHR's DR, so the DR on the first hop um, segment, will not send any more register messages for a fixed timeout. So this is the timeout that I was talking about in the last slide. So there is a fixed timeout, I believe it's 60 seconds, but I'm very bad with defaults, I hate memorizing them. But whatever that timeout is, the theoretical timeout, for that amount of time, the DR will completely go silent. Now, what this particular um, set of bullets doesn't tell you is that the RP will keep itself ready for any interested receivers if they choose to join the star comma G. So it will create an S comma G state 
and it'll keep that information in its multicast routing table, but it'll, it will take no action on it. It will take some action on it if it receives a star comma G join, but for right now, it just keeps that state active in its multicast routing table without doing anything with it. So for all intents and purposes, it would keep this in a prune state. And that null register message that is coming every fixed amount of time, 60 seconds, 180 seconds, whatever that is, that will keep the state alive. So it'll keep the state in an up fashion, but it's still pruned. There's no data flowing over this state. So in order to see this, so right now, this particular RP, R3, does not have a star comma G state. So there are no interested receivers for this group on the network. And the RP, or R1, actually receives that S comma G uh, multicast packet. It sends a register message to the RP, and the RP creates that S comma G uh, state without really doing anything with it. It's just an active state. So the RP is aware of the presence of a source sending to the stream, just in case there are any future interested receivers. And the RP is going to respond with a register stop message. So this could be the easiest steady state in a network. You have no interested receivers. You really don't want to do anything with that packet. You receive a register message. You respond with a register stop. And that's about it. So there are no more register messages during the timeout. So this is the simplest state, no interested receivers. The next state could be the RP actually has a star comma G state. So the RP has actually received some star comma G joins from last hop routers for that particular group. So there are interested receivers for this particular group. And this is the very first register message that has been received by the RP. So RP before this time had never really received a register message, so it wasn't aware of an S comma G. So it's literally the same scenario as the last scenario, but this time there are interested receivers. The RP will now decapsulate the multicast packet out of the unicast packet, and it will send it down the star comma G tree. So, and that's the whole purpose of, of tunneling that multicast packet in so that even those very first packets that are just triggering the registration, they are not missed. You, you'd really want to send them down to the interested receivers. So the RP will just simply decapsulate the multicast packet and send it down the star comma G tree. Furthermore, the RP can now initiate an S comma G join because it has that information it also has interested receivers. So now it makes sense to start the S comma G signaling towards the source. So you can actually start receiving those packets over multicast and not over unicast that is happening with the register message. The RP will keep track of this S comma G tree and it'll keep track of the multicast packets that it receives over the S comma G tree. So the establishment of the S comma G tree is one thing, but receiving an actual multicast packet over the S comma G tree is another thing. Once it starts receiving, or it literally receives that first packet over the S comma G tree, it can now send a register stop to the FHR to say that, hey, I don't really need the, I, the two things that you wanted to accomplish. One, create an S comma G state or make me aware of an S comma G state, make the RP aware, has been done. I'm aware of the state. Also, I'm receiving the packets over multicast now. So that second part of the encapsulation, that is also no longer needed. So I will send a register stop that should put you in a timeout. And from this point on, just do the steady state null register and register stop dance with me. So there's no more need to send the, uh, the actual multicast packets in a register message. And there's no need to send the register message other than just very sporadically on a regular basis, but infrequently. So in this particular case, it's the same exact thing as the, as the previous slide, but notice now there is a star comma G state. There is 
a star comma g state on the rp and by the way this s comma g state doesn't exist yet so that's a mistake on my part but there is a star comma g state it hasn't the rp is still not aware of the s comma g so the registration message has not happened so pretend that that s comma g doesn't really exist there what's going to happen next the fhr now receives a multicast packet it sends the register message but this time pay attention to the detail this time there is an actual multicast packet that it was always there but we were just not doing anything with it there is a multicast packet that is encapsulated in that unicast register message the rp receives this message and now it realizes that hey there are interested receivers for this particular group so what I need to do is take this message out and send it down the S com the star comma G tree towards my interested receiver. So even this very first packet that was in the register message, it will be received by one of the intended receivers. It doesn't go waste. And what is happening here now is every single packet, so that's, that may not be apparent looking at the slide, but every single packet that R1 gets, it creates, it generates a register message. So if it received 100 multicast packets, there is a chance that there are 100 register messages that are received by the RP before it could even do anything. And for every one of those 100, 100 packets, the RP will decapsulate the multicast packet and keep sending it down the star comma G tree. But that process is inefficient. So if we are doing multicast over unicast, then there is really no point of multicasting, right? So the next thing that the RP really does is that S comma G state is created. So this is the animation that was supposed to bring it up, but apparently I had the placeholder there. But really now the S comma G state has been created. So now there is this actual S comma G state that is here. And the RP realizes that it needs to join this S comma G state to this, or the S comma G tree to the star comma G tree. So it can now initiate the actual join process. So now there is a PIM state. So the yellow state was just a register state. This maroon state is a PIM state because RP is now initiating that S comma G join. We talked about that in the last lecture. The S comma G join towards R2. R2 is going to create that S comma G state. It's going to send it towards R1. R1 is going to add that interface to the oil. And finally, the packets are now going to flow over this, um, over the uh, S comma G tree. And finally, once it receives that very first packet, so it receives that very first multicast packet for the group, over the S comma G tree, now it can actually, or when I say it, now the RP can unicast that register stop message back to the FHR, and the FHR will seize the registration process for a fixed timeout. So this is what would happen if there were actual interested receivers in the network. Now you're receiving the packets. They're going from R1 to R2 to R3 over the S comma G tree. And from R3 to R4 to R6 and finally to the receiver over the star comma G tree. So now the actual multicast is taking place in the network. So just to rehash everything, the RP could have kept on receiving the traffic via the register tunnel. You know, there is an actual tunnel that is here. It's pretty fairly optimized. It could decapsulate those packets, pass it down the uh, star comma G tree, but that was defeating the whole purpose of multicast. So the other choice that we talked about the RP, now it knows the specific source. If it knows the specific source, it can send that explicit s comma g join towards the source and rp now becomes a leaf joins a tree with a known root which was s so remember where spts were rooted they were rooted at the actual source and it utilizes the plain jane pim join prune message that we discussed in the previous lecture to join that particular tree 
So just to take you back in time really, really quick about the S comma G join mechanism. Most of you should be familiar with it. Here's the S comma G join. It was the simpler of the two join. The prerequisite here was very, very important. So the prerequisite part now should make frankly a little bit more sense. The prerequisite was that the source must be known. And now the source is known because of the registration message, right? So source registration has taken place. The RP can use this message, message and in fact uses this message to build an SPT or an S comma G tree towards the FHR. The upstream neighbor, RPF neighbor to both the source, the multicast group, the desired groups IP, the joint source is the actual S. Every MHR performs the RPF check, processes the packet. So remember R2 and R animation processed that packet, created that S comma G state, had an IIF, added the interface to the oil, and all of that good stuff till finally the FHR. So I guess all of the uh, mistakes from my previous slide also carried on here. Finally, the first hop router receives the uh, M star comma uh, s comma g join it adds the oil to the s comma g state and there we go now the tree can actually be complete so this s comma g join process should now make a lot more sense so welcome back from that brief journey back in time now once the rp starts receiving the packets on the s comma g tree because remember the uh, fhr actually added the interface, the receiving interface from the MHR into the oil. So it can now start sending the multicast packets over the S comma G tree. So remember, it is also simultaneously encapsulating those packets in the register tunnel, but it is, it is also simultaneously sending those packets down the S comma G tree. The RP will finally at least receive one copy where it receives that message via the S comma G tree and also receives that message via, via the encapsulated uh, register message. But either way, once that very first packet shows up on the S comma G tree and the RP can tell the difference, it can now send a register stop to the FHR. So the final picture here is RP now receives the packets on the S comma G tree. RP relays these packets on the star comma G tree. So finally, the source and the receiver are now completely connected. Now, the final scenario that I want to discuss here, and like I said, this is supposed to be almost an exhaustive list, but it may not be. There are so many different permutations and combinations of what could be happening at the RP. It's almost impossible to cover most of them, but most of those are spawns of these basic, uh, these basic states. So hopefully you can you can leverage this knowledge into uh, a state that you've never seen before and take some good decisions and make some good assumptions as to what will actually happen. But in case I have missed a state, you can always leave a message in the comments and I can uh, cover it in an extra video or if it's very, very important, I could leave a comment back explaining how that happens. So the final state here could be the RP has an S comma G state. So RP has already put itself on the S comma G tree, which basically means that S comma G join process has completely taken place. There are packets that are coming over the SPT. In this particular case, there is an active S comma G state, SPT, and you're receiving packets. RP should theoretically only receive those steady state null register messages, right? So we discussed this and you should only, the RP should only be receiving the null register messages and it simply reg, uh, responds with the register stop. So it says, hey, I am aware there is an S comma G tree. Thank you very much. But really have no more use for this information right now. So put yourself in a timeout for whatever was our previously agreed upon time. And here is that state. So basically the RP has already connected everything together. There is an S comma G tree, the maroon tree. There is an, uh, uh, star, there is a star comma G tree, which is the green tree. And the packets are flowing over the S comma G and they are being relayed on the star comma G. In this particular state, you should receive that null message. So this is a null register message with that dummy IP header. 
and the RP should simply just respond with the register start message. And once again, these are both unicast, so there is not much more happening here. This should happen after every fixed timeout. So every register stop should put R1 in sort of a timeout, whatever that amount of time is. And after that timeout is over or it expires, R1 takes itself out of that stop state and sends another dummy null register message to RP. RP should once again respond with the register stop and they keep on dancing like this forever. That brings us to the end of part two of this uh, advanced PIM sparse mode lecture. There is one more part that I will be covering soon and that has to do with the SPT switchover, the mechanism called the SPT switchover. So stay tuned for that particular message, uh, that particular lecture. But as for this lecture, I really hope you've enjoyed it and thank you for watching.